Moving day means that you and your things are in for a big transition. There's a lot to figure out. New closets, different counter space, change of floor plan. No worries. CubeSmart is here to help make your move as easy as possible. Online or in person, CubeSmart provides a self-storage experience that puts the focus on you because you matter most. Moving can be costly, and that's why CubeSmart is offering up to 25% off your monthly rent. Say goodbye to moving stress and hello to your new address with CubeSmart self-storage. Visit CubeSmart.com for more details. Up next, Out Loud with John O'Caldwell, part of the Gingrich 360 Network. It was late on Memorial Day. The night was surprisingly cool. It felt more like early spring than early summer. My younger brother was sitting in a parked car on the south side of Chicago with a couple of his friends. Two men approached, pulled automatic pistols, and started firing. Bullets ripped through the car, shattered windows, punctured steel, and then skin. Later, the police would count 25 shell casings. When my mother called me, all she could get out was, your brother's and there was a shooting. Too many anxious seconds passed before I could pull from her which of my brothers had been shot and whether he was alive. Throughout, I stood alone in my Washington, D.C. apartment, powerless and shaking with anger and sadness. My brother had survived, I finally learned, and we thank God for that every day. But make no mistake, I could just as easily be discussing him in the past tense. My brother's best friend died in his arms that night shot through the back and into his heart. Both men covered in blood. Two more victims of the violence of Chicago. There were four multiple victim shootings in that same night. The holiday weekend left seven Chicagoans dead and another 45 with gunshot wounds. The victims included a 17-year-old student and a 21-year-old disabled man who had been shot while at the park he visited every day. As far too many panicked relatives gathered outside Mount Sinai Hospital early Tuesday morning waiting for the news of their loved ones, a passing car raced by and fired into the group. People were no longer safe, even in a hospital parking lot. No one was taken into custody for any of these shootings. The number of shootings had ultimately dropped from the year before when 71 people had been shot over the same weekend. At least that's how the local government was spending it. This is Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell. The excerpt I just read you is from my best-selling book titled Taken for Granted, How Conservatism Can Win Back the Americans That Liberalism Failed. Chapter 4, Murder to Excellence. On today's episode of Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell, I have a very special episode. Someone who's been a friend of mine for over a decade now, now that I think about it. It's been quite a long time. And when I was back in Illinois lobbying and for, the, for, for the state of Illinois in the state capitol, this young man told me that, hey, if you need anything here, I'll be happy to help. And when I had a bill that I needed his support on... He was happy to help. So I thank him, LaShawn Ford, a guy who's made a lot of national news talking about the violence in Chicago time and time again. Thank you for joining out loud with Gianno Caldwell, State Representative LaShawn Ford. It's an honor to be on. And you threw me for a loop because I thought you were going to say a very special guest and you said a very special show. Oh, I didn't say friend. (laughs) No, but this is a very special show because you're on and you're a special friend and a guest. Oh, no, that's bad. Okay, so can we clean it up? We, it, yes. Was it good? Okay, all right. There it is. All right, so, you know, we've been talking about the Chicago violence for quite a while with you. You've made national news um, many years ago for, one, when things were really, really hot in Chicago. They're still hot now, but when they were really hot, you went up and had a press conference, and you said we needed to bring in the National Guard into the city of Chicago to calm things down. Uh, what were your what was your thought process around that? And do you think the National Guard needs to be brought in again? You know, Gianno, not only um, did we ask for the National Guard then, we've asked for them um, since then and we've gotten them. And what we've learned is just what we knew then, that the National Guard could come in and they could actually assist the um, local law enforcement to make things safe for police and the residents. So. I think that we have to make sure that we 
um, keep all things um, on the table so that the criminals recognize that we will pull out the big um, guns if we need to because they're constantly pulling theirs out. And I have to tell you, I really appreciate you for shining the light on the violence in the city of Chicago when the local news many times and of course one of the democrat stations cnn never covered the violence and and shined the light on the murders that were happening to the babies in the city of chicago so i really appreciate you and fox for doing that you're a very interesting democrat you're one who really you're in the community you're knocking on the doors you're talking to the residents and you're not one that demonizes the police. You don't go around saying we need to defund the police and they you know, you want to work with the police and be a bridge bridge builder and bring about solutions. So I thank you for doing that. And as a matter of fact, this this month you sponsored a bill called Bad Apples and Law Enforcement Accountability Act of 2021. The bill in part deals with qualified immunity, which to quote the National Conference of State Legislatures protect state and local officials, including law enforcement officers, from individual liability unless the official violate a clearly established constitutional right. What's in the bill and why do you support it? Well, the most important thing that we have to do is take away the res all the right responsibilities that law enforcement are charged with. I mean, they're charged with being behavioral health counselors. They're charged with being um, parole officers, they're charged with so many different tasks that they didn't sign up with. They're charged with chasing people down because they have a, um, a incense um, hanging from the windshield. We put too much on law enforcement and we expect so much from them. They're human too. And so what we want to do is protect our law enforcement um, community so that they could protect us. That's our goal, to make sure that we get rid of bad apples. There are bad politicians. There are bad police. There are bad um, teachers. There are bad talk show hosts. You name it. No matter where you go, there are bad people in every profession. And what I want to do is build a relationship with the FOP in Chicago and law enforcement so that they can advocate for themselves. No one knows better than law enforcement how to make their jobs safer, and how to better serve the community. So if we could just work together with the um, teachers, like with the, if we could just work together with the law enforcement unions so that they could fight the way the teachers fight for um, better um, outcomes, I think we'd do well. But do you think that the unions though protect some of the bad cops that we see? You think about people um, who really have shot individuals who didn't have weapons. Um, a, a lot of these officers were really protected by the unions. They provide uh, attorneys for them. Do you think the unions have too much control? I'm hearing you say that, you know, they should be able to do whatever they need to do, but isn't the, the idea that they have a little bit too much control and they're protecting the bad apples? I think you're, they are protecting bad apples, but when you have a union, you have police that sign up to be protected. And the unions, they do what the um, members want. They want their members to protect them. And of course, I'm totally against people being shot in the back by law enforcement, but the unions have to recognize that it only makes other cops look bad when we know that you're standing up for someone that is clearly, um, you know, kneeing someone to death. You can't do that when you are defending a cop that shot a kid 16 times in Chicago, literally smoked Laquan McDonald, you know, and this cop that killed Laquan McDonald actually got a job with the FOP. You can't do that if you want to be um, looked upon as someone that has the best interests of society. Yeah, and and I do agree with that point. It, it's shocking that I didn't know that he got a job with the Fraternal Order of Police. Uh, and that's another reason why I think these unions have gone far, way too far in terms of protecting bad cops. You know, I understand unions, they donate to Democrats. and Maybe you've even got a, a piece of that pie. I don't know. But this has become just too much. 
And I think the the unions, uh, they're doing the wrong duty, if you will. Now, there was a bill signed in February of this year, and it was a House Bill 3653, the Police and Criminal Justice Reform Bill, which I know a lot of officers have complained about. You know, you can report an officer anonymously and there doesn't have to be any proof and that that officer could lose their job. Was your your bill in some way affixed to some of the things that were wrong in that 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 criminal justice bill? You know, we're working with law enforcement. Here's the problem that we had when we passed that law. We want to work with law enforcement, but just like most professions, people struggle with change and the initial response is always to push back and say no to change. But what we have to do in this country, in the state, is to make sure that we recognize that there needs to be changes in the way we protect police and the way police protect citizens in this country. And so there are some cleanups that we're working on with law enforcement, but we would have never got to the point of passing a bill like this if we had not pushed the issue forward. So now law enforcement in Illinois, they're really at the table working to do some cleanup language for, um, from the um, bill that we passed and signed into law. And this is, this is one of the vehicles that you're using to make those corrections, is that right? That's right, yes. Okay. Now, your, your bill was introduced after the release of a video showing a police officer fatally shooting a 13-year-old. Um, the officer seemed to make a split-second decision to shoot Adam, that was his name, after seeing uh, what appeared to be a gun in his hand. How do we judge the actions of police officers in situations in which they think there is imminent danger and they need to make split-second decisions? Think about the shooting in Ohio as an example. That was another instance of an officer making a split second decision. You know, you can never be in their shoes. And I respect the fact that law enforcement have families and they want to go home too. What we have to do is make sure that we, as Democrats, push to make sure these communities, that these officers are forced to patrol, that we don't put children on the street that don't have a high quality education. That's the problem. The police are dealing with issues that we as a society have created for them. For the most part, police are not failing kids that drop out of school. It's the school systems that's failing the kids that have dropped out of school. Not only did the school system fail the kids, they failed the kids' parents and they failed generations. And so police have to deal with that. And so, I think we have to do everything we can to prevent as much interaction or as little interaction with um, law enforcement as possible. We put them in a tough situation. I'm not making excuses for them, but we have to make sure that we treat people with dignity and give them an opportunity to thrive in this state. And we have to make sure that we give law enforcement the education and the training and put accountability in place so that everyone is protected. Now, you, you sound a bit like Tim Scott as you talk about these issues, very pragmatic, uh, certainly uh, uh, very intelligent on the issue. A lot of your fellow Democrats nationally and locally don't seem to speak that same way when it comes to police officers. They're more so about demonizing the police. You think about the defund the police movement, almost nine hundred billion dollars, nine hundred million dollars. I'm sorry, almost a billion dollars defunded from the police um, across the country and crime has gone up rather homicides have gone up 33 percent nationally since 20, 2020 you look at out of 63 out of the largest 66 uh, ju- police jurisdiction at least one crime a uh, major crime uh, violent act has gone up there's been an increase across the country what do you say to your fellow democrats locally and nationally who continue to demonize the police and, and, and the jobs that they're doing You know, I I think that before um, a person turns to a life of crime, Democrats, we have an opportunity to save them from that. I think that that's the key, that we need to make sure that when we see these kids and their families struggling, we know before they hit the street that they are going down the wrong path and we allow them to go out there and police are trained 
to protect us. We have to make sure that the police are better trained, that there's accountability, but we also have to make sure that we protect our kids from a life of crime. That's the problem. You know, although we know that there are some innocent black and brown people that have been shot and killed by the police, but we also know that there are a lot of black kids being killed by black people as well. And we have to do something about that in this community. And it all comes from poverty. We're talking to LaShawn Ford, a Democrat serving in the Illinois House of Representatives. We got much more with him out there. Quick break. People say treat yourself like you need a reason. But McDonald's treats are perfect for every day. Like bold McCafe iced coffee. Get any size for $1.69. Or pick up any size sweet tea for a dollar. The largest served in an insulated cup that keeps your tea cold. Feeling a little extra something something? Try the classic bakery sweets like an apple fritter. With so many ways to treat yourself, you don't need an excuse. Just come back tomorrow. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. Hey, it's Buck Sexton. If you feel like a lot of the country's gone mad, you got COVID lockdowns and all kinds of crazy Marxist tyranny from the Democrats, you're not alone. In fact, you've got reinforcements at the ready. Join me every day to be a part of a common sense conversation where we fight the madness of the left, speak the truth, and bring together like-minded people. The Buck Sexton Show. You can listen to the Buck Sexton Show podcast every weekday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. You know, you talk about the economic policies, and you, you just mentioned it all comes from poverty. In 2019, October 2019, to, to be exact, record low unemployment, Hispanic uh, unemployment rate of 3.9 percent. African Americans were 5.5 percent. Uh, uh, the unemployment rate was 5.5 percent. We're talking about the lowest on record. We saw prosperity through our communities. And these were Trump policies, let's be clear and honest about what that was. This is the reason why the country was doing so well, and especially in communities like the ones you and I grew up in, because you're a former teacher. Uh, you lived in some of these rough communities, and your district is in one of the roughest communities on the west side of Chicago. So we've seen just a little bit, and I don't want to make it seem like it's like, oh, yeah, this has been going on forever in a day. So it things did change economically and they had recently changed now things are kind of back to where they were prior trump so if if the economics was there people were prospering why was crime still high because oftentimes we hear a lot of the folks the social workers and policy wonks say if we could only put people in a better economic position we wouldn't see as much crime but that didn't necessarily change the tide in a place like chicago well, you know, I think that it would have been worse. There were families that um, I think that have been invited into the middle class and um, that, that things could have been worse. But I think we got generations of, of poverty. And so when you look at generations, it's going to take time to crawl out of this, um, this hole that we're in. Communities are struggling and starving in Chicago, you know on the south and west sides of Chicago, it looks totally different. Vacant and abandoned buildings, you know, um, vacant lots. We still have land on the west side of Chicago and the south side of Chicago from the 1968 riots that hasn't been redeveloped and it's been ignored all the while developing downtown Chicago, developing the north sides of Chicago and developing everywhere but where black people live. That's a problem. And anytime you have that, Gianna, you're going to have chaos. You have um, families that deal with this trauma, not just the trauma of drug overdose, not just the trauma of hearing gunshots and people being killed, but the trauma of having very little green space where people could have a pleasant walk outside of their neighborhood. Now, that's a great point. And, and you're right. There are a lot of buildings on the south and west side of Chicago which haven't been redeveloped or there's just vacant lots. And that happened after the, the riots, after the, the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. You're 100 percent correct. But my question to you is, as a Democrat, the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois has been ran by Democrats. 
for decades. There's not been any Republican influence. It can't be blamed on Republicans like I see a lot of national uh, uh, Democrats do. They blame everything on Republicans. This can't be blamed on Republicans. So do black lives really matter to the Democratic Party in the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois? If they did, why wouldn't we see a difference? Because you just mentioned the city, the downtown being developed, the north side. These are where a lot majority white people live. So why is there such a distinction between where black people live and white people in the city of Chicago, where it's a, a strong black majority and certainly a majority Democrat city? Now, I cannot argue that point. And I can agree with you. Um, and I know that there has been a lot of recognition. You've done a great job of calling it out to the people across this country that the Democrats have failed the uh, black community. But I see both sides. I see black people caught in the middle of it because the Republicans also don't understand how deep of a hole the black communities are in. And I hear the Republicans saying, you got to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. It, it works for some people and it worked for families that have structure and it works for people that have the ability to fight. But when you have people that have trauma and have mental health problems and don't have family, you have um, other health conditions and just can't do it, whether you're white or black, it's going to be a struggle. Now, the Democrats clearly have failed the black community, but also the black community must recognize that the power is in our vote. And it's always a case when it's election time. <laughs> They're always coming. We're always going to the churches. We're always going in the neighborhood, spending millions of dollars to win the black vote. But after the election, black people got to realize that's when the work begins. You know, regardless if there's a Republican or a Democrat, you still have to work with them and you have to make them do what needs to happen for the community. So I blame the Democrats for not um, living up to the values of what Democrats are supposed to do, because when you look at the life of black people in the state, you would think that it would be a state of emergency for a Democratic governor like J.B. Pritzker. You would think that it would be a state of emergency in the city of Chicago for a black mayor like Lori Lightfoot. But you know what? For some reason, it's not a state of emergency when black people constantly get shot down in the communities, when black people continue to have um, subpar um, elementary and high schools and lack of, 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 of um, grocery stores in the neighborhood so that they can have fresh fruits and vegetables to live a, a healthy life. Black people have to wake up and we have to make sure that we demand, just like we're seeing migrants demand something. I've, you know, the migrants have taken a page out of the, the black people movement from the time we were um, taken and, and freed from enslavement. We had a fight in us and we need that back. Migrants, they are not citizens, but they make demands of this country. And I think that Black people need to wake up and realize that this is the country that they're from, it's their land, and they have every right to fly the American flag and make sure that the American uh, flag stands for them. And if they do that, I think we're going to be in better shape. We can't sit back and wait for Democrats to do it for us. Government only works for people that, um, that make it work. Even in your party, Gianna, Republicans will cater to those that force them to. Government only answers the call when the bell is rang. They're not going to just come out and, and, and fix it for you. You got to make them do it. Yeah. No, that's um, a really good analysis. And I thank you for it. Now, you in your community, you're you're very well loved on the west side of Chicago. Um, I've been in your office. I've seen how you've interact with the residents. You really actually truly care. You do spend time with them. So you you've done a really great job as an elected official and, and being accessible to your people. Um, why don't you run for mayor of Chicago? 
You know, I, I ran for mayor, of course, uh, for Chicago. It was a really, really challenging um, uh, race. Had lots of people in the race. And I got off to a short, uh, a late start. And, you know, my goal right now is hopefully we could work with this mayor. She's got a couple of more years, but she's struggling right now. I know the pandemic has caused some problems, but the only way we're going to turn this around is to deal with the problems at hand. We can't govern like everything is normal and expect for things to change. When you get a spot like the mayor, when you get a spot like the uh, governor, when you get these spots, you have the ability to turn the tide and make a big difference because you set the agenda. We need to set the agenda to make sure that people that have been left behind in this city will finally have an opportunity to um, be at the table. You know, I mean, it's so easy. You see the problem. You know, you got to look at it as if it's your family. And if your family is struggling, what are you going to do? Are you going to look for solutions or are you just going to say, oh, well? You know, one of the solutions, as you mentioned, uh, that is often proposed by Democrats in Chicago is gun control. And as you know, uh, previous uh, or rather before the Supreme Court uh, had a landmark case, which was McDonald v. the city of Chicago. It was a older African-American gentleman who wanted to the right to protect himself in his home. Uh, and, and he was on the south side of Chicago and some some young gang members had broken into his home a number of times and he needed that right to, to bear arms. And that changed the entire landscape for the for the whole country. So thank uh, Mr. McDonald for that. He died uh, maybe some years ago. But I mean, obviously a patriot to push something like that. Now, Democrats have always talked about gun control and Chicago had the most gun, uh, comprehensive gun control laws on the books. And it never changed, never changed the scenario in Chicago where so many black bodies are just uh, buried in the streets, if you will. So many people dying uh, on a weekly basis. You saw in one weekend, 72 people shot. What is the solution now from Democrats on the violence in Chicago? I, I can't tell you what the uh, solution is because there is no state of emergency. I mean, anytime you have the number of people being killed in the city of Chicago and there's no emergency response, the number of people being killed in the city of Chicago on the west and south side, we know, is greater than the number of people being killed or been killed in war. And anytime you see that there is a area in this country, even America knows that if people are being tortured in another country, this country goes and help. Well, here we are in the city of Chicago in the country and black people are being killed every day. And not just Chicago, but in all the urban cities across this country, and there's no state of emergency for this. The question that you asked earlier, does black lives really matter? I have to give credit to the white people that have stepped up and said, let's fix this problem. Black lives matter. But I have to challenge my black people. Where are you? Step up. The white people, I have to say, when you see these marches of black lives matter, you see more white people marching than blacks. And that's heartbreaking because what's happening right now is George Floyd's life and death has changed the way people think. It has opened up people's minds. And this is a generation right now that's ready to help change America. But black people have to lead. One thing I know about some white people they will step there, use their white skin and their white privilege to help their black friends, black society, but they're not gonna get in the way. They're gonna support you and they're gonna help, but we gotta make sure that we lead and they're gonna be right there with us. They proved it all summer long and they're proving it every day that they're ready to help us. So it's gonna be up to us to, you know, you think about that March 
that insurrection at the Capitol, God knows that should never happen. But do you know that that happened because some people were angry at something that happened in this country? Could you imagine if black people had that type of anger because black people are being killed all over this country and they decided to say enough is enough and decided to go to their capitals to demand change, what would happen? Now, I'm not saying that they should have an insurrection, but just march on your capital, march on your city halls. You have to say enough is enough and we're not accepting this anymore. I think that the Trump supporters were upset that Trump didn't win the election and they wanted to make sure that there was a recount or whatever. But nevertheless, they believe that this country um, should respond to their demands and answer to their concerns. Black people got to feel the same way that this country should answer their demands and respond to our concerns. That I mean, that's that's a I think a pretty powerful analysis. So you're saying that the folks need to feel the urgency in their own communities. But here's um, a, a thought. I remember being what I was maybe 14 years old marching with Fredrina Lyle, who was the alderman of the sixth ward in Chicago, and then Mayor Daly and the superintendent of police, Terry Hillard. I even got a newspaper clipping of it because I was in the front row marching with them as we were on the south side of Chicago marching. Uh, uh, against the violence in Chicago. So we've seen a lot of marches. We've seen some protests. I get what you're saying. It needs to be a heightened level. But we've been doing this for, what, I was 14 at the time? So uh, uh, <laughs> that was many years, many years ago. Uh, well over a decade, this has been going on. Decades, I should say, that there's been a very violent place. And some would argue, especially with the gun, not the gun culture, but the gang culture, has shifted. It used to have at least some organization formatting. You think about people like Larry Bernard Hoover, who started the Gangster Disciples, and things were organized back then. And I'm not celebrating the organization of the gangs, but at least then you knew that only if you were a part of that culture, if you were a member of that gang, or if you affiliated with them, that your life could be in jeopardy. Now, you can be a 74-year-old woman watering your grass and your life be in jeopardy, or you can be a seven-year-old a little kid, a baby girl, and with her dad going through a McDonald's drive through and lose your life. It has no system anymore. People are just dying now. So we've done a lot of marches. We've done a number of things to try to prevent this from happening. And it continues to happen. It sounds like leadership change is probably more necessitous than anything else. Would you agree with that? Yeah, leadership is it needs to be changed. I think their marches help and they've helped even advance this nation, even though it doesn't seem like it. But there has been so much change um, because of people taking part in it. Everybody's got to do their part. You got to have people marching. You got to have people listening to those people that's marching. And you got to have people in the legislature that's ready to make change in public policy and appropriations. You got to have lawyers that's willing to come out and and help out as well. I say that every march has advanced us a step closer, and I think people should continue to march. But you don't stop marching. You don't march for a day. You march with a goal in mind, and you don't let up until you get it. And you build on that march. You get more people to join you so that you can um, achieve the goals that you're achieving. You know, it, 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 no matter who you are, everything that as relates to justice takes a long time to achieve for the most part. I know that um, women have been fighting, whether they're black, white, Hispanic, they've been fighting for years for equal pay. So it's not going to just come easy. I think that people should just recognize that this country, <laughs> it takes time to bring about change. But the only way it's gonna, um, that change is gonna come is if we're willing to have some fortitude and consistency and build coalitions. We got a strong coalition in this country right now because no matter where you come from, I think that people recognize that this country has to change 
as a result of George Floyd, we have so many people now that's a part of the mindset that something must change in this country. And we are in a good spot right now. And black people have to recognize it, that if they're ready to um, realize this change, they better step up now. I want to shift gears a bit and talk about you and President Trump. Before we move on, let's take a quick break. Back in a second. On the next episode of Rush Limbaugh, the man behind the golden EIP microphone. Literally, we were there every single day together for 20 years. We had the advantage to actually have real conversations with Rush in the studio. People that sat with me for 20 years. He was never a celebrity to the three of us. Right. You know? <laughs> right. He may have been to all these people who would come and visit us, but he never was to us. Rush was like a second father for me because I probably spent more time with him than any anybody in the last 20 years. Dawn Machinsky, Brian Johnson, who with me witnessed almost every single show that Rush did. We've all gone through so many things in our lives together. He had tremendous confidence in, in me and that helped give me tremendous confidence. And I told him that before he died. Join us for our next episode. My family, Rush's radio family, Dawn and Brian. Coming Wednesday to iHeartRadio or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Hey everyone, Lisa Booth here, and I am so excited to let you know that I am launching a brand new podcast, The Truth, with Lisa Booth starting March 24th. As a former pollster, political advisor, and now a television commentator, I have earned your trust by telling you the truth. And I can make this promise to you right here, right now, I will always give it to you straight. And I guarantee that we're gonna learn something new and we'll also be entertained with each episode. Whether it's just me on air, leaving no stone unturned to get to the bottom of the hottest issues impacting your life, or whether I'm interviewing some of the biggest names out there, I will always think for myself. You should too. Look, you don't always have to agree with me, but if you're tired of being talked down to, this is your podcast. And if you're tired of hearing the same tired talking points and you want some fresh takes, this is also your podcast. If you want to know what's really happening in our country without the spin, without the BS, then this is a podcast for you. Listen to The Truth with Lisa Booth every Wednesday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Sign up and subscribe today. criticized by some of your fellow Democrats for welcoming Trump's help and calling for the National Guard to come to Chicago. In fact, you said we need to work with the president and force him to stop the flow of drugs and guns to Illinois. Talk about why you were willing to work with President Trump and the flack you received for that. You know, I think that you, when you are in a situation and you've tried everything with your party and with the people that you're working with and you can't get results and then you have the highest um, and the, the person with the most power in the country saying that he wants to help Chicago whether people believe it or not having the spotlight on Chicago with the president of the United States saying we have to do something about it the only way I think we could deal with that is say yes we want your help who turns away help? Who turns away the fact that there's attention being shined on a problem? I wasn't willing to do that. I was willing to invite the president into this um, city so that we could have gotten help. What people fail to realize, it's not the president that was going to actually do the work. But when the president came to town, he was bringing state agencies. He was going to bring directors and he was going to bring people from different departments and we would meet with them and we would have connections in that White House to help the city of Chicago. There was a city of Chicago said, we don't want help from that man. I called flag because they felt that I was, um, you know, working with a bad person. You know, all I know is that he was the president of the United States and I respect the office of the presidency and I always will. Now, I, I, I appreciate that because I remember when I interviewed you that day for Fox and Friends and it, that interview went really wide because people were so shocked to hear, especially a black Democrat, not just a Democrat, but a black Democrat in one of Chicago's hardest hit areas representing one of Chicago's hit, hardest hit areas saying, hey, I welcome 
President Trump's support. If he wants to truly help us, if he's serious about it, I'll, I'll be here. And I know there was a lot of people who were really pissed off at you, including the mayor of Chicago at the time. And they were very, very upset for you extending a hand uh, in Chicago. Now, now that Trump's out of office and clearly he can't do anything about what's going on in Chicago, you got a Democrat in office. Are you aware of any conversations happening with City Hall right now, the Mayor Larry Life, Lori Lightfoot, or even yourself talking to um, uh, Joe Biden about what's going on in Chicago? And if if you were to get an invitation to a meeting, what would you ask for? Well, one, I think that Chicago's got a, a problem where we have illegal drugs, illegal guns infiltrating our streets. So we need the president of the United States to protect the Second Amendment and make sure that people that are legal carriers, people that have legal guns could enjoy their Second Amendment. It's been robbed because you have so many people that have these um, illegal guns coming in from border states. And I would ask the president to convene um, some type of um, task force with border states, bordering Illinois, and figure out how we can stop the flow of illegal um, drugs and guns coming into Illinois. Drug, drug running and, and gun running has been a problem. We need him to do that. That's going to be very helpful. It's going to clean up the neighborhoods, and it's going to give people an opportunity to live. Also, I would ask the president to start and send money to this, um, to this um, state so that we can have trade schools. And I know trade schools would really change lives. Not everyone wants to go to a university, to a college. We need to have something for people to go to trade schools so that they can live a life of dignity. And we don't have that. There's no trade school that a black person or anyone on the West side could walk into and say, I have this skill and I want to perfect it. It's either you go to college or there's nothing for you. And that doesn't work in the white community. It doesn't work in a Hispanic community. And it truly doesn't work in the black community. We're failing the inner city kids that want and have talent by not giving them an opportunity to um, be successful. So trade schools and, um, doing everything that we can to reduce the cost of college. I appreciate that. That was, uh, um, that's excellent. And you're right about the trade schools. Not everybody wants to go to college and not everyone should go to college. So definitely find a trade, perfect it, and you can make a lot of money doing that. And I appreciate that analysis because especially you're right. You see it in a lot of uh, white communities. They do do that. They don't say, Hey, Go to college or we're going to beat you over the head for it or you're all of a sudden a loser. But we do see that in our community oftentimes. I'm not sure what happens in a Hispanic community, but certainly I've seen it in our community where we'll uh, berate someone uh, for not for not doing that. And not everyone's intended to do that. Now, let me ask you this, because you mentioned about the, the, the legal drugs and guns and you talked about supporting the Second Amendment. And I, I concealed carry is now available in Illinois, and I would encourage everyone to do that. I actually... Uh, just got my concealed carry certificate and I'm waiting for my permit to come in the mail here in Florida. But Chicago is a sanctuary city where we've seen a number of individuals. Uh, you're talking about folks who are immigrants, who are undocumented, who are illegal immigrants, if you will, who are in the city of Chicago that commit crimes. And the city under Rahm Emanuel is started where it was declared a sanctuary city where they don't work with federal law enforcement to get those folks out of the community. Some of these people are committing very violent crimes and they're repeat offenders, but yet and still, there's no deportation. What do you say about that as a Democrat? I'm not sure where you stand on that issue and and uh, your party clearly believes in it. Why? You know, I think one, I'm a Catholic and I have to tell you, I believe in treating the human um, being in a humane way. Um, but I also believe that we have to make sure that we protect home and we have to make sure that we, that there's a process by which we allow for people to enter into the um, country. It's OK. I mean, if we're going to let people in, 
you know, we need to make sure that we know who's coming. We need to make sure that that um, we protect them coming in and uh, make sure that we provide the necessary support for them as well and protect the people that's um, in the country. We know that there are some drug running from across the border and that has hurt us. And um, that can't happen. We know that there are some babies that's been um, probably, um, you know, taken away from their families and being brought over in the country for um, for bad reasons and, and using them in, in sex trades. That kind of stuff is troubling to me. And so I think that the president of the United States has a responsibility to one, if you're going to allow this type of open borders, do it in a way that's going to protect everybody. Well, there it is. Follow the law. Uh, so I appreciate that. You know, I want to thank you for your time. This has been a very insightful conversation. And beyond your political affiliation, you're an honest person and you just tell it like it is. And you've taken flack over the years, time and time again, for just being honest. But what keeps you in office is the fact that your constituent no, constituents know that you truly care and you have a heart for them. And I have been able to see it up close and personal. So I want to thank you, State Representative LaShawn Ford, for joining me today. Can you tell folks if you have any big legislation coming up that people should know about and what your social media handles are so folks can follow you there for some more common sense conversation? Well, you know, I'm Justice for All 44. That's my handle, my Twitter handle, Justice for all that's the number 444 and you know what i want most is for us to just um listen to one another and not just shut people off i mean if a person has a perspective if we really want to be respectful in society we should just listen to their perspective we don't have to buy it now but if we're true to wanting to change society, we will listen more to people. That will help out a great deal. Now, Representative Ford, I have to ask you, what did you think of the content of what Senator Scott said when he said America is not a racist country? Well, you know, it depends, you know, what how you take it. When I took it, I took it as, I think he's saying, we have this country, this great country that we all love. We all love America. You know, whether you're an American citizen or a migrant trying to get here, you love America. And so when I heard him say it, I said, well, you know, this country that we all love is not racist. It's the people in it. And so I think people should build off of what he said and challenge the people that hurt the um, that hurt that hurt America. You know, it's not the country itself. It's like saying that I live in a house and my house is racist. The house can't be racist. And we understand that this country was built and developed by white men and the founding fathers were white, but we have developed in, a, in, a, in this country and we have amendments and we have a constitution and we know that the Constitution didn't include black people, but this is America. The America that he was talking about, I would say is the foundation that we all continue to try to perfect. And it's not racist. We got to deal with the people that's racist. Before I let you go, let me ask you just on a national question, because um, you're right about that. You're absolutely correct. We should be listening more to each other. You. You saw the, the State of the Union address recently, and I'm, I'm sure you have with Joe Biden. And I'm sure you saw the response that Tim Scott gave in the State of the Union address. After he gave his response, Senator Tim Scott, he was trending on Twitter, Uncle Tom, Uncle Tim. Uh, he was called a house N-word, a coon, a, you know, a lot of these things that folks, black conservatives are often called. What was your take on that? You know, I don't like the name calling. I think that Tim Scott has um, the right to say what he want, uh, what he wants to say, and I think we should listen to him. He's got a seat at the table with the Republicans, and I think black people. You don't have to vote for him, but you can also give him your perspective. I think that he understands 
And to have someone like him at the table, I think that we hurt ourselves by following in the mockery of him when he doesn't have to be right on everything that he says, but he's a human. And what we should do is listen to him, offer up positive um, uh, criticism or offer a rebuttal in a positive way so that he could better frame his thinking. I tell you, I guarantee you, Tim Scott is developing as time goes on. He's evolving. And so to condemn him because he made a comment, we're actually hurting ourselves because what we're not doing is engaging with him. We must listen and engage and we must encourage people to um, be better and we have to be better. If you're being negative, then you got to ask yourself, what do you really want? That's it. What do you what do you really want? Well, thank you so much, State Representative LaShawn Ford, uh, for joining me on Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell. And we certainly look forward to uh, hearing more about the, the promise and legislation you're going to be bringing to Illinois. And hopefully at some point we can have a conversation where the, the numbers of murders and shootings has drastically gone down and people feel safe to live in their own home or go to the grocery store or water their grass. Because right now, the citizens of Chicago, even in downtown areas, do not feel safe. So thank you again for joining me. It's definitely an honor and a pleasure to be on Out Loud with Gianna Codwell. Thank you so very much. I want to thank State Representative LaShawn Ford again for a great interview. If you're enjoying the show, please leave us a review and rate us with five stars on Apple Podcasts. If you have any questions for me, please email me at outloud at gingrich360.com and I'll try to answer them in our future episodes. And please sign up for my monthly newsletter at gingrich360.com slash outloud. You can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Parlor at Gianno Caldwell. And if you're interested in learning more about my story, please pick up a copy of my best-selling book titled Taken for Granted, How Conservatism Can Win Back the Americans That Liberalism Failed. Special thanks to our producer, John Cassio, researcher Aaron Klingman, and executive producers Debbie Meyer and Speaker Newt Gingrich, part of the Gingrich 360 Network. Today on News 4 at 4, we're working for you. An inside look at the local COVID vaccine trial for kids, what children reported days after getting the shot, and how it could impact the timeline of kids being vaccinated. Today at 4 p.m. on NBC4. Tonight, it's the Voice Live Rounds, and Nick Jonas wants his first win. Let's get this done. Who's got what it takes and whose dream ends here? Watch live and vote to save your faves. The Voice Live Rounds, tonight on NBC. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to launch my very first podcast, The Truth, with Lisa Booth, with iHeartRadio and Gingrich 360. The Truth with Lisa Booth is a podcast that rejects groupthink, rejects fake news, and will never bow down to the political correctness poisoning this country from within. If you're ready to step outside of your comfort zone and join me on this wild ride, then buckle up and tune in on March 24th for my very first episode, The Truth with Lisa Booth, every single Wednesday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.